Hi, I'm Gavin Giovannoni. I'm Professor of Neurology at Barts in the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. I'm re-recording my presentation I did uh, on the IWIMS webinar earlier this week uh, to try and give more finesse to the hypothesis I was trying to put forward um, regarding anti-CD therapies and vaccine readiness uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. A uh, large number of disclosures uh, important for this presentation is that I have been uh, uh, a steering committee member on the phase three ocrelizumab uh, development program and I am the principal investigator of the oratoria hand uh, study that's about to start in the UK. Well, what about anti-CD20 and COVID-19? So this data was presented just over a week ago by Jan Hillet just showing you that in Sweden if you're on uh, rituximab, uh, you're probably more likely to develop uh, COVID-19 than people on other disease-modifying therapies. And I, I did a quick uh, uh, data hack, just, just doing what I call a chi-squared test, and it is significant in that um, more rituximab patients got COVID-19 than other disease-modifying treatments. Now, this is uh, biased data in the sense that um, maybe the rituximab treated patients are younger, more mobile, more likely to go out. Uh, and so there are a lot of confounders. So this may not necessarily uh, hold up uh, long term. When you look at severity, in other words, those requiring hospital admission, um, rituximab versus non rituximab treated patients uh, were no different in terms of uh, um, having severe COVID 19 as defined by hospitalization. Just after the presentation last week, uh, Roche and Genentech put forward their first 100 patients reported to them via the standard pharmacovigilance uh, um, uh, reporting system they have in place. And as you can see, 26% of these patients had serious COVID-19 and 5% were critical, uh, requiring ventilation. Uh, importantly, there was no deaths in this. Now this data is what it is. It's just spontaneous reporting from across the world, you can see all the countries involved and there's very little uh, other information to put this into context. However, if you look at the general population, um, about 20 to 25% of people would have uh, serious COVID-19 and about 5% would have critical and the mortality rate is around one to 2% and there were no deaths in this group. So it's looking not too dissimilar to um, what you'd expect in the general population. Now, I would say that this is uh, likely to be biased in many ways. First of all, MS patients uh, tend not to be, uh, on ocrelizumab tend not to be like the general population, they may be younger. So you'd expect these figures to be better. But then again, in terms of reporting bias, uh, clinicians or healthcare professionals may be more likely to report severe cases. And therefore, the, what I would call the less severe cases happening in the community, not coming to hospital, won't get captured and not get reported. So I think uh, the overall message though, based on this data and the registry data from Italy, France, Germany, United States, and across the world is that it doesn't appear that there is an increased incidence of COVID-19 in people on disease modifying tra treatments, including uh, anti-CD20, and they don't appear to have more severe disease, uh, uh, more severe disease. To try and explain this in more detail, I've got the spectrum of uh, um, serona, serona, um, SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID-19 disease spectrum. Um, as you can see, um, we have asymptomatic infection. Now, the rates of that depends probably on age. Um, it looks like uh, the older you are, the less likely you are to have asymptomatic infection. Uh, and then we have mild and moderate, severe and death. Uh, and so severe and death refers to those patients requiring hospitalization. Uh, um, whereas mild and moderate, these tend to be managed in the, in, in the home environment. <laughs> So based um, on what we know, it's unlikely that an anti-CD20 therapy increases your chance of becoming infected with the virus. What dictates that really is being exposed to the virus. So those are the things like social distancing, personal hygiene, staying at home, uh, be it self-isolation or reducing your contact with the general population and shielding will determine that risk, Not to, nothing to do with the therapy you're on. Based on the uh, Swedish data set, there is this possibility that being on an anti-CD20 therapy, in this case, rituximab, and I must be point out that the dosing of rituximab in Sweden is highly variable. 
goes from one gram six monthly to 500 milligrams six monthly and now some of the centers in Sweden are extending the dosing uh, to nine and 12 and even 18 months between doses so I think we have to assume that uh, rituximab dosing is variable in that population so based on that data it's possibly that it uh, increases your chances of becoming uh, symptomatic based on both the rituximab and ocrelizumab data the it doesn't look like an anti-CD20 therapy increases your chance of uh, becoming severe or dying from uh, COVID-19. I'll put a question mark around all these because uh, at the moment we just don't have enough uh, data in terms of control data to make this statement. And the hypothesis that still remains is maybe, just maybe, um, anti-CD20 therapies actually improve your outcome and reduce the risk of developing adult respiratory distress syndrome, which is the second phase of the uh, um, COVID-19. First phase is the viral and upper respiratory tract viral infection phase. The second phase is the lower respiratory tract pneumonia and uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome. We think the second phase is driven by mainly the immune response to the virus. Uh, and that's why uh, a large number of immunotherapies, both immunosuppressive and a whole of other therapies have been tested in COVID-19 to try and dampen down the cytokine storm and the inflammatory action in the lung. We know that B cells play a part in this because post-mortem tissue from people dying uh, of COVID-19, the lung is full of uh, macrophages and neutrophils. Uh, the, we do see some B cells in there and other uh, lymphocytes, uh, but there is uh, immunoglobulin deposition and complement activation. Now, when that occurs, is probably quite late in the course of the uh, lung disease. And the reason why I say that is because the antibody response doesn't happen uh, early. But if we, if we can dampen down the antibody and uh, response, we may be able to reduce the uh, complement mediated damage that occurs uh, in the lung and also antibody also activates macrophages. So there's, there are mechanisms why a brisk antibody response to uh, um, the, the coronavirus may actually exacerbate or make the uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome works. So the question then is, does this uh, immune response in terms of antibodies make increase your chances of getting severe uh, COVID-19? And if you inhibit the antibody production by being on anti-CD20 therapy, for example, uh, and you prevent the cascade, in other words, complement activation and macrophage activation, do you dampen down? And, uh, and I think that's a question that has to be answered long term. Um, and hopefully we may be able to see once we have bigger and deeper data sets, uh, whether or not uh, people with multiple sclerosis on anti-CD20 therapy who are B cell depleted, who get COVID-19, do they have a uh, a lower risk of getting severe or uh, COVID-19 or dying from COVID-19. In support of the immunosuppressive hypothesis, there is this data from the uh, UK intensive care audit database, uh, just showing you that in the uh, initial um, 2000 plus patients admitted to British intensive care units, only 2.3% were on immunosuppressive therapy which is almost four times lower than expected based on comparing it to uh, viral pneumonias, mainly uh, in, in flu epidemics uh, uh, in the 2017 to 2019 uh, period. So this overall would suggest that maybe being on immunosuppressive therapy protects you from severe uh, COVID-19. Um, in addition to this, there is data emerging from solid organ transplant, both renal and kidney. Um, uh, rheumatology, uh, RA, uh, dermatology, psoriasis, that it appears that people that are on immunosuppressive therapies uh, are potentially at uh, a lower uh, risk of getting severe COVID-19. So I think the overall um, uh, picture is looking re relatively favorable uh, and contrary to our initial uh, expectations that people on immunosuppressive therapy are at more uh, or greater risk of developing severe COVID-19. I think there's, there are caveats. It also depends on the intensity because um, in the New York renal transplant uh, cohort, uh, patients that had recently had ATG, antithymocyte uh, globulin, which really depletes your T cells quite profoundly, were at a high risk of dying from uh, coronavirus infection. 
And so I assume you do need some T cell response to control the virus. Um, um, but if you have some dampened down T cell responses, it protects you from the immunopathology in the lung. So it's probably a, a narrow window where immunosuppression or immunomodulation uh, lowers your risks of getting severe COVID-19. Anyway, we'll wait for the trials because there are several ongoing studies now looking at immunosuppressive therapies to try and prevent severe COVID-19. What is quite clear is you don't need B cells to recover from COVID-19. And this is uh, two cases. You always ask the question, how many swallows does it take to make a, a, a summer? But uh, I think this is a natural experiment of two uh, males in Italy who had X-linked a gamma globulinemia. So these uh, two patients would have no peripheral B cells and they survive by getting uh, IVIG immunoglobulin given to them. Now the virus, SARS coronavirus 2 is a novel virus, so the background population don't have antibodies to it. So the immunotherapy in terms of intravenous immunoglobulin doesn't contain antibody against this virus. Uh, and the important point is these people were infected, these two people were infected with um, coronavirus, they cleared it and made a good recovery. So it proves that you don't need B cells, okay, to, to overcome this infection. We now know from, stu from studies that were done in the original SARS coronavirus 1 infection that what's important for viral clearance is neutrophils, macrophages, and the cytotoxic CD8 T lymphocytes in terms of viral clearance. And uh, natural killer cells and CD20 positive B cells uh, don't have a big role to play in the initial clearance of the virus. Obviously, with secondary infection, when you get re-exposed to the virus, it's different. Uh, uh, we know that um, antibody responses there, particularly they're neutralizing and bind to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein will reduce the infectivity of that. But in the context that we're referring to right now, we're not talking about secondary immune responses. We're talking about primary uh, infection. The secondary infection or secondary immune responses may be relevant when it comes to uh, vaccine readiness. And this is a one case report from Australia just showing you that somebody who develops uh, COVID-19, when they come in, they've got um, viral shedding. And you can see they have um, anti, uh, T cell responses, CD8 T cell responses that come on quite early. Okay. Uh, and, and CD4 T cell responses that come on quite early. Uh, whereas the antibody responses are, are quite delayed. You can see the antibody responses are only beginning to, in terms of the antibody secreting cells are only beginning to uh, emerge um, after the patients have made a recovery, day seven. And yeah, you can see when you look at the IgG and IgM antibodies, they only start to appear several days um, um, from day seven onwards uh, after the patient has made a recovery. So this is another point that the antibodies are not necessarily uh, uh, necessary to clear you of the infection. Now, the question that we're putting forward is these antibodies may be responsible for contributing to that second phase or that immunopathology that occurs in the lungs and results in adult respiratory distress syndrome. So the hypothesis, if you can blunt or block this antibody response, maybe you'll be able to protect the lung uh, from uh, some of the damage that occurs from uh, immunoglobulin deposition and complement activation and further um, uh, macrophage activity. This is just a, an experiment, controlled experiment in two monkeys infected with coronavirus 2. And you can see they get immunity within three to five days uh, and the antibody responses are only really detected after, uh, after seven days. So again, in a primate model of the infection, control of the virus, not related to antibody responses, which occur later. So that brings us a point about vaccine readiness. So this is just uh, a cartoon I drew to try and explain the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19. And uh, what we are hoping to do is, um, go, well, we are, we've gone from the peak of the epidemic and we're on the down now, and we're hoping to avoid um, secondary, uh, tertiary or quaternary um, uh, peaks. <laughs> this is why um, most public health 
uh, departments are developing strategies, what we call a whack-a-mole strategy, is to, to uh, identify cases, find contacts and shield them, quarantine them to try and prevent a further epidemic. Um, there are some hypotheses that we may get a seasonal surge based on the fact that the virus is temperature sensitive. And so the WHO, for example, is predicting uh, a seasonal surge in, in the autumn. Anyway, the idea is we will go from, a, at some point in time, herd immunity will get to a point where we go from being an epidemic into an endemic where the virus circulates in the community. And hopefully we'll be able to chop the tail off with vaccination. With vaccination. When the vaccine will arrive is debatable. My prediction is uh, about a 60% chance of getting an effective vaccine. Um, the nuclear, the um, uh, RNA and DNA vaccines are likely to emerge first because they're easier to produce, whereas the component vaccines are more harder to produce. But anyway, uh, the important point is, will patients be able to respond if they're on an anti-CD20 therapy? And I suspect not. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because uh, patients that are on anti-CD20 therapy don't have functional germinal centers. So this is just looking at an ant uh, a lymph node biopsy from a control patient versus that somebody on an anti-CD20 therapy. And I want to point out in this uh, lymph node, you can see these little brown dots, which are germinal centers. And in the lymph nodes from the people with anti-CD20 therapy, there are no germinal centers. And the same thing happens in the spleen. Now, germinal centers are those little universities where we educate B cells. In other words, we allow them to class switch. So they go from IgM to IgA or IgG, or one of the IgG subtypes. And there's this process called affinity maturation for us to make good quality, high affinity antibodies. So the fact that we don't have germinal centers means that we can't educate uh, B cells and select for high affinity, high quality antibodies. So I suspect the antibody response on anti-CD20 therapies is not only going to be blunted, but the quality of those antibody responses will be low. In other words, there won't be efficient uh, affinity maturation and we're unlikely to get very good quality neutralizing antibodies in you know, antibodies that bind to the um, receptor binding domain and stop the virus being, in, uh, being infectious. We know already from ocrelizumab vaccination st study that uh, people on ocrelizumab can make antibody responses, but they're blunted. Uh, and this is to recall antigens, be it influenza uh, or novel ones like uh, Kiel lymphoid hemocyanin, which is a new antigen. Importantly, the uh, uh, antibody responses to sac polysaccharides, which is what's in the uh, pneumococcal vaccine, is very blunted. Uh, and this is another message is that to make antibody responses to uh, sugars, uh, glycoproteins, you really do need germinal center activity because they are quite complex antigens to, to make antibody against. <clears throat> And it's relevant because the uh, spike protein, which is the protein that's responsible for binding to the ACE2 receptor is heavily glycosylated. Uh, and for a reason, you know, these viruses acquire these heavy glycosylation patterns as part of their immune evasion strategy. And uh, um, so these sugar molecules are really important antigen determining sites. So, I think to make an effective neutralizing antibody response to the spike protein, we're going to need functional germinal centers. So I predict or hypothesize that um, uh, antibody responses in people on anti-CD20 therapy are going to be blunted and we're unlikely to make good quality neutralizing antibodies. Uh, which is why we're going to have to wait for B cell reconstitution to occur. Uh, almost certainly going to have to have B cell reconstitution occurring before we vaccinate patients. And with ocrelizumab, and this is the phase two extension trial, you can see patients were last dosed at week 72 or week uh, month 18. And you look at B cell counts in the peripheral blood, uh, there's six months, nine months, 12 months. So it takes about nine to 12 months and p potentially longer for B cell reconstitution to occur. So I would have, to, I would predict that if you've got somebody on an anti-CD uh, and you want to get them ready for a vaccine, you're probably going to have to miss one or two doses and check B cell reconstitution before vaccinating them. The important thing, these cells that come back are not memory. They are naive. They come from the bone marrow and therefore they are the kind of cells that you would require for vaccine responses. Hidden in this data, you can see um, in this data set, 
that was presented by um, Steve Hauser uh, in 2013, that um, oculizumab has quite an impact on cytotoxic or CD8 positive T lymphocytes. You can see there's a dose response in the depletion kinetics. This was 1,000 milligrams versus 600. And you can see a dose response. Uh, and we know about this because um, there's a small population of T cells that express CD20. And so oculizumab has a much more depleting effect on CD, uh, CD8 cells than rituximab, uh, indicating that it is a more potent depleter. And I think this depletion is relevant because with oculizumab, we have seen a herpes zoster shingles signal. Um, we, we got a, about 2% of patients got shingles, which is not really seen with rituximab. And we now know that oculizumab is a much more potent depleting agent than, than rituximab. Um, so this is not, I don't think we should ignore this. It's relevant to uh, the safety of oculizumab. The problem, um, and, I, and I, I want to talk about this, is because it's happening in Sweden already. Uh, clinicians now see patients who are relapse and MRI activity free, and they're beginning to extend the dosing with rituximab from 6 to 9 to 12 months to 18 months, thinking that it's fine. And I think in terms of vaccine readiness, we may be doing this and think it's fine because these patients are unlikely to become active in terms of MRI activity. Um, uh, and I just want to point out that MS is not relapses and it's not MRI activity. It's disease progression and end organ damage, brain volume loss. And the reason why I say that is, is because when you use the Prentice criteria for defining a surrogate endpoint, okay, uh, relapses and MRI activity don't predict outcome uh, in all cohorts of patients studied. And uh, this is just one data set. This is the 15 year follow up of the original uh, uh, Avonex trial. And you can see that if you are on Avonex uh, and in that two year of the trial, you had evidence of relapses or MRI activity in the, f in the form of GAD enhancing lesions or new T2 lesions. Okay, in other words, you weren't responding to interferon, you were much more likely to end up in the upper quartile of poor outcome. However, if you had activity and you're on placebo, it didn't predict outcome. And so based on this, this is a very important observation. Based on this, MS cannot be, cannot be gain enhancing or focal activity in MRI and relapses. If MS, if that was the disease, it would predict outcome regardless of you on treatment or not. Okay, uh, and I think this is a, a thing that's ignored, uh, and we all know it because we all see patients with more advanced MS without relapses, without MRI, are still getting worse. Um, and so, I think we need to just be very careful uh, in terms of judging effectiveness based purely on focal inflammatory events. MRI activity and relapses. Another clue to this is when you actually put somebody on a highly effective therapy and yes, nadalizumab and you stop relapses because most people on nadalizumab after year one are relapse free, you still get a significant number of patients developing worsening of their disability. This is 37%, all right? And most of that has got nothing to do with relapses. So 25% of that, two thirds of those disability progression events are in relapse-free patients or outside of periods related to relapses. Similarly, when we did the same analysis, but using a composite to define progression in the uh, uh, phase three OPERA-1 and OPERA-2 trials of oculizumab versus Rebif, we saw the same thing, except oculizumab is more potent at suppressing relapses, but almost 90% of the progression events uh, were independent of relapses, which we call PERA. Uh, and on interferon, it was uh, 80%. <clears throat> so the real MS has to be the disease progression and the superimposed relapse in MRI activity is in response to whatever is causing this disease. Uh, another clue to this has come from the results and this is slides that Steve Hauser has kindly given me to use, is the ofatumumab versus teriflunamide uh, phase three trial program. And you can see ofatumumab is very effective in suppressing both relapses by about 55% and MRI activity by about 95% compared to teriflunamide. So you say, goodness me, this is a very effective therapy compared to uh, teriflunamide. Uh, 
But when you go to what I call the real MS, which is the progression rates, uh, it's an impact on progression relative to effluent was, was modest, so, you know, 32 to 34%. And when you look at brain volume loss, particularly in year two, because you've got a rebaseline uh, at 12 months, there is no difference between um, an anti CD, uh, CD of tumimab here and uh, teriflunamide. Uh, so this disconnect um, between uh, focal inflammatory events and what's driving progression and brain volume loss is, is uh, obvious. Uh, and I think we've got to be very careful uh, uh, in extending dosing um, because of focal inflammatory events when the real MS is uh, underneath all that. Uh, and another clue to this uh, phenomenon uh, comes from the dose, dosing of ocrelizumab uh, uh, in the phase three relapsing and primary progressive cohort. So Steve Hauser presented this at the American Academy uh, uh, last year. And this basically is everybody in the trial was getting 300 milligrams. <clears throat> And they got 300 milligrams, 300 milligrams, uh, week one and week uh, uh, week two, uh, first dose. And then they get 600 milligrams every six months after that. Now, as you've got to realize in the trial, some people are large, some people are small, that will get in the same dose. So if you're 120 kilograms and you get a 600 milligram, uh, compared to somebody who's 60 kilograms, that 60 kilogram person is getting double the dose. So you can actually measure blood levels of um, ocrelizumab. And you can uh, correlate that those with the highest blood levels of ocrelizumab have had the lowest B cell numbers. Uh, and so there's kind of like a dose response because of the fixed dosing in the trial. And when you actually break up people into what we call quartiles, quartiles one, two, three, and four, based on peripheral ocrelizumab uh, levels, and you look at uh, GAD enhancing lesions or new T2 lesions, there is no difference. So you would say, doesn't really matter what dose of ocrelizumab you get, it suppresses relapse, it suppresses MRI activity to some degree. And the same thing was observed in the primary progressive cohort, no difference compared to placebo. So therefore, we don't have to worry about dose. It's uh, possibly we're overdosing ocrelizumab. Uh, and the similar observation was uh, seen as relapses. There was no relapses. However, when you looked at disease progression, and this is confirmed disease progression at 24 weeks, there's a clear ladder. So the higher your exposure, the higher your blood levels, okay, the more impact it had on disease progression. 0 0.34, okay, 0 0.7, 0 0.85, 0 0.47, 0 0.34. So, uh, you know, if, in, so this brings up the hypothesis that you need to be on higher doses to impact on this disease progression. This was also seen in the uh, uh, primary progressive cohort. This is the uh, oratorio primary progressive study. Again, the patients in the upper quartile, the highest doses relative to body size and all, all the other things that affect uh, blood levels had the best response. Now, why this happens is a, a hypothesis. Is this because of better or uh, deep tissue? peripheral deep tissue uh, depletion, or alternatively, is it because the higher the dose, the more likely you are to get antibody into the brain and spinal cord to, to target the intrathecal the B cell response. And uh, we've actually proposed to uh, Roche Genentech to do a trial to test this. So you put patients on a standard dose and compare them to like a double dose, and you do lumbar punctures and uh, lymph node biopsies uh, to see if this is driven by uh, peripheral deep tissue uh, depletion or CNS uh, B cell depletion. And you can, our uh, proposal is to use uh, spinal fluid immunoglobulin uh, light chain levels, which is a biomarker of uh, intrathecal B cell and plasma cell activity. So be careful about reducing doses of anti-CD20 therapy based on MRI and relapse monitoring, you may be actually reducing the effectiveness uh, of uh, the anti-CD20. <clears throat> so based on the hypothesis I've discussed with you, um, I think there is a dose response that has an impact on a whole lot of functions. 
Uh, and so what I would say uh, in this hypothesis, this graph to uh, discuss this hypothesis, uh, uh, there we have blue bars are untreated. And then we have a, a hierarchy based on the level of B cell depletion of a tumor map, which will hopefully be launched in the next uh, year, um, has quite rapid B cell reconstitution. So it can't be doing too much in terms of deep tissue uh, uh, depletion. Then we've got low dose rituximab, high dose rituximab, low dose oculizumab, high dose oculizumab. This is basically a dose response of anti-CD20 therapy based on uh, B cell reconstitution rates. In other words, deep tissue uh, uh, B cell depletion. Um, basically in the blood using our standard assays, you don't notice a dose effect between these. B cells are essentially zero, but if you use high sensitivity assays, you'll almost certainly find differences between uh, the, uh, these agents. Uh, we know that for a fact based on the oculizumab uh, studies, those with the higher oculizumab levels had lower B cells than those with the lower oculizumab levels. Um, I predict there's a dif difference in deep tissue B cell depletion. I, I, I hypothesize that there will be a difference. So people on high dose oculizumab will more likely drop their CSF light chain levels compared to pe people in other therapies. Obviously, the more peripheral uh, B cell depletion there is, the less your antibody response will be um, uh, to the virus, to the coronavirus, and that may protect you from getting severe. This, this has to be looked at uh, in the data sets that have been collecting. Obviously, when it comes to vaccines, your vaccine response is going to go down, and I suspect the quality of the vaccine response will also go down with the, the more depletion of B cells you have. And then when it comes to B cell uh, reconstitution rates, uh, the lower your peripheral tissue B cell depletion, the quicker you reconstitute in the peripheral blood. Uh, I'll, I'll point out that I'd be surprised if we found any differences between relapse and MRI activity rates between these doses, because there's a floor effect. We've seen that quite clearly with uh, um, the oculizumab peripheral blood pharmacokinetic uh, pharmacodynamic data. Okay, however, I predict that if we look carefully uh, disease progression or brain atrophy rates, we will find a dose response. So the higher the, um, the dose of anti-CD20, in other words, the more B cell depletion there is, the better the outcome will be in terms of the real MS, disease progression and end organ damage. Now the question is, do you need this long term? I don't, I don't think so. My hypothesis would be, my understanding is you just need to deplete those pathogenic B cells or the Epstein-Barr virus. It's one hypothesis that lives in those memory B cells. So you deplete, uh, and then you don't really have to keep them depleted forever. So you could potentially use anti-CD20 therapies as a immune reconstitution therapy, uh, or use it as an induction agent and then maintain with another agent. Uh, and I've put this forward as an hypothesis where you'd use a potent B cell depleter. And then when you allow the B cells to reconstitute, you bring them back in the presence of say, a drug like terioflunomide that is antiviral in works against Epstein-Barr virus to prevent reinfection of the B cells with uh, EBV that is you know, causally linked to MS. Uh, and I would love to do the study of uh, induction maintenance, anti-CD20 followed by a maintenance agent. Um, I think uh, over the next six, 12, 18 months, some of the questions uh, 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 proposed in this uh, bar graph here will be answered. So the questions we need to answer as soon as possible to help us neurologists manage patients with uh, MS in the COVID-19 era uh, is are anti-SARS coronavirus 2 antibodies protective against reinfection? That's a question that's been proposed now globally by the WHO, for example. Once you've had this infection, have an antibody response, are you protected from reinfection? I think we need to answer that as soon as possible. And that has implications for vaccine uh, responses as well. And what are the anti-SARS-CoV antibody responses in patients uh, on anti-CD20 or other disease modifying treatments? Are there quantitative differences? Uh, in other words, do you make a lower titer, lower level of antibody on an anti-CD20 compared to say for somebody on an interferon, for example? And are there qualitative differences? Are you less likely to make uh, IgG class three, for example, IgG3, for example? And are, uh, are you less likely to make good quality or neutralizing antibodies? And I, my, my guess would be yes. Uh, people on anti-CD20 therapies are gonna make lower titers, they're gonna have less class switching, and they're gonna have uh, fewer neutralizing antibodies. 
compared to people that, that aren't on uh, anti-CD20 therapies. And then the uh, third thing is it'll merge is which vaccine will be the most effective in inducing antibody responses. Uh, is it going to be the DNA RNA vaccines, which I hope so, because those ones will get uh, through clinical development quickest uh, and they're easy to scale up in terms of production compared to uh, the other uh, vaccine um, targets. Um, for those of you who want to keep up to date, I rep, you know, as new information comes, I rapidly change this table. This is a table about uh, the attributes of licensed DMTs and, and how to use them during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I have this on my um, COVID-19 and MS microsite. I call this MS selfie. And uh, this, this table is on version five now. And as new information comes up or new ideas come up, uh, I update it and justify it. So if you want to keep up to date with what's happening in the field, please follow, follow this table on MS selfie. And questions, um, I'll, put this, I'll put this on social media uh, so we can have a discussion. Please uh, ask any questions if you have them. Thank you.